Um, let me introduce myself. I'm, I'm Scott Newton. I'm the head of the School of Law, Gender and Media at SOAS University of London, and we're hosting the conference on carceral policy, policing and race, which has been proceeding um, yesterday and today, um, and has really been a, an, a, an extraordinary event. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry you haven't been able to uh, participate directly, um, but we, 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 we're glad to be able to offer you this opportunity to participate, um, at least in this fashion. So my, 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 our plan is to record this session and then to make it available to conference participants following. So please understand, as I've said, as we proceed, that, that um, most of the people who would be attending uh, this panel are not because they're physically at the conference. Um, and it's been, uh, as I said, a, a really um, extraordinary and we hope transformative event. In my opening remarks yesterday, I said that this is really a watershed moment um, for issues um, of race in relation to carceral policy generally, carcerality and policing practices around the world. And this is, I, we, 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 when we conceived this conference uh, with, with David Lammy, um, really in a process beginning two years back, um, we knew already that there were many people who were working on these issues um, from different perspectives in different geographic context, but we really had no idea that we'd get the kind of robust uh, turnout and response that we have done um, and, and, and a collection of really front-ranking scholars <clears throat> and activists, both um, who are doing critical cutting edge work. Um, and although uh, given our, our, our sort of traditional geographic remit, we have been focusing on Africa, Asia, the Middle East, and uh, the Caribbean and Latin America, and we have had uh, contributions uh, respecting North America, which are obviously critical for all sorts of reasons, um, particularly in respect of, of, of um, indigenous populations and indigenous issues. So we're, we're especially pleased to be able to convene this panel. So um, let, let me, uh, without further ado, introduce you bearing in mind that you, you are being introduced prospectively to the audience, which, which, which we um, are expecting will, will um, access the recording um, at some near point. Um, so uh, I'd like uh, then to introduce um, Professor, in, in, in the order in which I've uh, received um, their information, and, and then that's the order in which we'll we'll we'll, we'll proceed. Um, and uh, Dr. Uh, Samir Boule is, is is our uh, missing participant, and we have uh, set him for third in in, in the uh, sequence of, of presentations. So I I'm hoping earnestly that he joins us by the, the by the time he's due to go on stage. Um, uh, Professor Patricia uh, Barkaskas is Métis from Alberta. Um, her research has focused on the intersection of justice and, and law, including access to justice, clinical le legal education, and decolonizing and indigenizing law. She's particularly interested in examining the value of indigenous pedagogies in experiential learning, in clinical legal education, and in skills-based legal training, and disrupting the normative violence of uh, colonial legal education. Um, which continues in multiple forms and places. Um, and uh, Dr. Borkaskas uh, will be addressing us on the, on the theme of decolonizing and indigenizing law. Um, so uh, Dr. Borkaskas, Patricia, if you wouldn't mind, over to you. So you'll have um, 15 minutes uh, as will each of the succeeding participants, and then we'll reserve another 15, 20 minutes at the end for questions and conversation, really, since we're such a, a, a an intimate gathering here. So I'm, I'd like to see this sort of, you know, at the end, develop into a conversation. Um, but to frame that conversation, uh, Patricia, why don't you lead off? Thank you. Marci, Tanashi Kiyawao, Patricia Rakaskas, Dashini Kashan. Um, it's a pleasure to be joining you today from the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people here in uh, what is called Victoria, British Columbia. Um, 
my work recently has taken me to the law school at the University of Victoria, where I'm on a one year, um, a one year contract uh, with the law school, um, teaching in their first year program, and also we'll be doing some work uh, for them on the um, newly, um, well, the newly beginning National Center on Indigenous Laws. So I'm very pleased to, to be joining you today to talk a little bit about decolonizing and indigenizing law, um, specifically in the context of policing carcerality and, um, and what's happening here uh, in BC, but in Canada, moreover, in terms of thinking through how um, the court systems are dealing with Indigenous people still, um, despite the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada, and despite the um, murdered, murdered and missing women's and girls inquiry, um, and the calls for justice coming out of that inquiry. So um, I do regret that once I, after I'm done speaking, I'm going to have to go because I have to teach this morning, uh, unfortunately. Um, so I'm sorry about that, but I'm very willing to um, take questions by email if people want to get in touch with me later. Um, and they can reach me at pbarkaskis at uvic.ca. Um, so I can provide that information and people are very welcome to get in touch with me. I'm sorry that I'll have to miss the conversation because I'm sure the discussion will be very rich. Um, so I want to start with um, the, I want to start kind of at the, the end of something, I think is what I'll call it, even though it's not really the end. Um, I want to start with the report um, that was issued on the RCMP investigation into the death of Colton Blushi, um, which took place, which happened um, in um, August 9th of 2016. So for those of you who aren't familiar with the Barton case, um, that, or sorry, not the Barton case, my apologies, that's a different case, which I will talk about, uh, the Stanley case. It was a case in which Gerald Stanley, a Saskatchewan farmer, um, was tried for um, the murder of um, Colton Bushy, a young Red Pheasant First Nation um, member who he shot and killed uh, in a motor vehicle that was on his property. And um, the, the horror of that event in and of itself um, was exacerbated by the way that the RCMP dealt with that situation. So the investigation, though this is not what the report says, um, the investigation was um, horrific, and I'll, I'll give a trigger warning here, I'm going to talk about some pretty awful things, in the sense that um, a number of events occurred that the RCMP did not um, did not take full responsibility for, on which the report found them to have conducted themselves reasonably um, in doing so. So one of the first things that happened was in reporting about the, um, the death of Mr. Bushi um, to his family, the RCMP showed up at his house and um, and basically threatened his mother. Um, they, they showed up and um, arrived on the reserve, arrived at the family's home and treated the family members as though they were criminals themselves, um, which would probably not be surprising to any of you if you lived in Canada and had any idea what it's like in terms of the relationship between the RCMP and Indigenous peoples. Um, so that was one thing that happened. Another thing that happened, and this is all detailed in various um, various accounts, uh, but is that they, they left um, Mr. Bushi's body um, in the vehicle outside for a period of time, um, there was rain that washed away um, important blood evidence, um, blood spatter evidence. Um, but in general, they disrespected his body and treated it um, as they would not, I think, have treated the body of a person who was not Indigenous. That case and the resulting trial. Um, and the events that flow from it um, have, have led to the report. Like I said, the commission did make a number of recommendations despite finding that the RCMP conducted themselves reasonably. 
Um, but at the end of the day, the reason that I bring this up is because it's a, it's a prime example of the ways in which the in which policing in our country here in Canada has has not taken up any of the myriad um, calls for change over many, 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 many years. So starting with the Royal, well, not even starting with the Royal Commission, there were things before that, but the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples, which happened in 1996, um, the Manitoba Justice Inquiry, um, the same, the same things happen over and over and over again, that really highlight the ways in which racism, anti-Indigenous racism in particular, in this case, although um, anti-Black racism and certainly racism against um, other racialized folks and peoples of color is certainly alive and well in this country too. I don't want to diminish that in any way, despite the fact that I'm focusing here on Indigenous peoples. Um, and it, it intersects in all kinds of ways. So, we have the Stanley case and what happened to Colton Bushi. Um, we also have the Barton case, which I mentioned previously, um, which was the case um, in which Mr. Barton um, was having sexual relations with a woman whose name is Cindy Gladue. And in the course of those relations, he, he inflicted a wound on her um, with a knife, um, that wound. And again, this will be explicit content. Um, was in her vagina and she bled to death. Um, he left her in a bathtub in a hotel motel room to die. Um, and the most that is that is egregious and horrible, of course, and there's no no way to um, there's no way to uh, talk about that without being completely um, stunned by the the, the the horror of it. Um, but what the court system did in response is also um, horrible. So as a part of the trial of Mr. Barton, the um, Crown prosecutor thought it appropriate to allow um, into evidence or bring into evidence um, Ms. Gladue's um, body in order to put that before the court, before the jury. Um, and it was, it was the kind of thing that can only be described as shocking beyond belief that a Crown prosecutor would think that it was appropriate to bring a person, a woman, a mother, a daughter, um, her body into court, her dismembered body, um, the part of her body where the wound was inflicted um, and display it um, and refer to it as Jean Taillé has, has so eloquently um, put to the Supreme Court of Canada and her submissions to the court on behalf of the women of the Métis Nation. Um, her they made her into tissue. They reduced her to tissue, to a body part. They took away her humanity and uh, all of her dignity in doing so, and broke all kinds of laws and protocols um, of both her Métis and Cree Indigenous cultures and legal orders. Um, so when, when I think about the idea of the possibilities around <laughs> um, change, which is what we're really talking about here in this particular panel, um, I have, um, I have very little hope at this point that we are seeing real change in terms of what the police are doing and in terms of the treatment, especially in places like Alberta and Saskatchewan and Manitoba in particular, um, around the treatment and the, um, the issue of anti-Indigenous racism in the police and the court systems, including, um, sorry, cat including when the, um, you know, the Supreme Court of Canada can, can make decisions at the end of the day about some of these cases and the ways that they do. We've just had an Indigenous woman elected to the Supreme Court of, or appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada, which is a, um, 
a huge change. It's the first time it's happened in, in all of Canada's history. Um, so we'll, we'll see what happens with that. Um, it's obviously a monumentous appointment. Um, and I just want to turn in, in the few minutes I have left to, to some of the things that are happening that, that I do see in terms of possibility or hope. Uh, in terms of change that's going on so it's not really it's not really change in 1999 the case of um um gladu was at the supreme court of canada which was the first interpretation of our criminal justice section um 718.2e which is colloquially referred to as um as the gladu um provision based on that case um, that that section of the criminal code 718.2e came out of the act to amend the criminal code um, and other acts in 1995 and um, there were there were some responses to it immediately as I mentioned the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples was taking place in 1996 so in bridging the cultural divide um, that commission stated that the statement of purposes and principles of 718.2e um, certainly does not preclude imposing a sentence that it emphasizes restorative and healing goals, but these are not given priority, nor are they seen as anchoring the sentencing process. And I would say that that's still the case. So although we have this provision, which allows for um, and has sort of created the need for specialized reports, which are referred to as GLAD-DO reports when it comes to the sentencing of Indigenous peoples, and the provision which tells us that they must, um, that judges must in all cases consider um, all alternatives to incarceration. Um, we've seen that, that over time, we've seen, I think, three things importantly. One is that um, judges don't all accept that to be their duty. Um, and we have the joint cases of Ipoli and Ladu, um, which followed in 2012. So quite a quite a breadth of time in between those two things when the Supreme Court of Canada um, took the opportunity to remind judges across the country that they have a statutory duty to consider all alternatives to incarceration. Um, but Gladue reports, which are produced um, for the sentencing of Indigenous peoples in this country, um, are not are not accessible to all people. We have seen um, so too when these Gladue reports are used, we've seen that they do work um, in cases where resources exist to provide the alternatives to incarceration. And of course, in many many communities, especially those that are more remote, um, those resources don't exist. So this tension exists between the use, the idea of using GLADU reports, which is a great idea, um, the fact that they do work when they're used properly um, to provide the court with the context of colonialism and all of the ways in which an Indigenous person has been criminalized, marginalized, stigmatized, and pathologized throughout not just their life, but the lives usually of their community and their family. So it addresses both intergenerational trauma and intergenerational injustice, um, which is a term that comes from Hadley Friedland's work, um, which I think is a more appropriate way to think about what happens for Indigenous people than just intergenerational trauma. Um, so glad you reports, which contextualize all of that for judges and in a way that is um, meant to be neutral and unbiased from the writer um, and then puts forward um, potential heal a potential healing plan as an alternative to incarceration, um, do work when the resources exist and when judges take account of them properly, and also when defense counsel utilize them properly. Because to put a report like that in front of a judge and simply ask the judge to consider it without considering um, its contextual basis and without advocacy <laughs> um, is sometimes, well, not sometimes, which is, is often what happens with those reports, um, unfortunately. Despite the duty of Defence Council and actually of Crown based on the Supreme Court of Canada's um, decisions in, Glad in Gladu and then Ipoli and Ladu, um, where they tell us that that if a judge doesn't take judicial notice of these things, it's council, both council's responsibility to make sure that that happens. Um, so we do see that these are used well and, and very useful to judges when they are used well. Um, and that really has to do with when they're available 
And unfortunately, they are, they are not available in most places in Canada in most times when you have Indigenous people before the courts. Um, so as a part of a, a project with the International Centre for Criminal Law Reform um, back in 2019, um, I was part of a team that produced a report called the Production and Delivery of Gladue Pre-Sentence Reports, a review of selected Canadian programs. Um, that report is available online and it really sets out the um, the details of where and how reports are available and a number of recommendations about what needs to be done in order to service Indigenous peoples appropriately according to Canadian law itself. <laughs> um, and we've had more conversations since 2019 about the ways in which to incorporate Indigenous law into sentencing of Indigenous peoples. Um, there are a number of courts um, across Canada specifically in BC and then in Ontario with the Gladue Court. These are mentioned in the report a bit too, but there's been more work since um, Indigenous courts. But those are still, they still fall under the provisions of the criminal code, right? They're still using com Canadian common law. Um, although judges are becoming better at accepting and thinking about the ways in which Indigenous laws should and could be incorporated into what we call healing plans, which is the alternative to incarceration. So that's sort of a wide breadth of information and uh, uh, hugely um, simplified um, overall summary of some stuff that's going on. Um, and uh, yeah, I'll leave you with that. But like I said, I'm very happy to um, take questions or comments or follow up in any way with folks um, because I can't stay for the discussion. Um, again, my email is pbarkaskas, is spelled B-A-R-K-A-S-K-A-S -K -K at uvic.ca. And um, it's really a pleasure to have been here this morning to speak with folks and to uh, let you know a little bit of what's going on over here in Canada. Patricia, as a fellow academic, I'm, I'm well aware of the pressures of the looming classroom. Um, <laughs> could I exercise Chair's prerogative just to put a brief question to you in the way? Absolutely. That's really compelling, but just so that we have it on record. I mean, I, I just mm -hmm. find the, the, the Glad You Report mechanism absolutely fascinating, compelling. And, mm -hmm. and it's, it, I realize that it has, it's of limited efficacy, it's case specific. Um, I, and it's it, 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 it's very targeted, but nonetheless, as a measure of decolonizing, indigenizing um, the application of law, it seems to be a significant gain. Um, and, and I'm just wondering if uh, using the kind of, you know, glad to rationale or, or, or principle, um, particularly given its limitation to specific cases, um, whether one might not envisage um, to rolling it out and, and, and pioneering or trialing so glad you training for Crown Council, for RCMP, for judges for that matter, which in, 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 as part of a, a, a basic formal uh, legal education or professional education. So rather than having, I, I'm using the, the same idea and the same principles, um, but educating judges and prosecutors and police to the very particular circumstances of, of, of Indigenous people that they are likely to come across in the execution of their duties as, as a fundamental yeah. part of their training on which, for instance, they could be tested, et cetera. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I think yeah. it is fair to say that that recommendation has been made several times. So the Truth and Reconciliation Commission of Canada made that recommendation, um, the calls for justice coming out of the um, Murdered and Missing Women and Girls inquiry made that recommendation and um, certainly academic scholars and um, activists have been calling for that for a long time. And again, not just in terms of Indigenous folks, but BIPOC folks overall. Um, but specific to Gladue and, and the ways in which the circumstances of colonialism have impacted Indigenous peoples and why that means that they are more criminalized um, is is something that's very important and it is happening to some degree. So we see it, we see it just, I certainly saw it a lot more post TRC. So in the sort of early, um, or I guess in the second half of the, the um, you know, 2000 teens. So, you know, 2016, 2017, 2018 and 19, I was doing a lot of educating of Crown Council and government lawyers. That's still going on to some degree. But I think that there's um, a sense somehow for people that they've got it, 
at this point, you know, they've been educated um, because they've had like one talk by one person one time. Um, and I don't mean to be flippant about it, but that really is sort of the way that people end up taking that up, um, which is highly problematic. The one place that I'll say that that isn't happening in that same sort of one-off kind of way is with judges. Um, so the National Judicial Institute is taking this this very seriously and their work to educate judges about the circumstances of Indigenous people, about their duty as judges when it comes to GLADU and, and GLADU reports um, is, is, is a real commitment that they've made. Um, so I've participated in, in some of these um, some of these discussions and I can tell you that the judges who do attend and of course judicial education isn't mandatory so um, that's always an issue but but I do see a lot of judges taking this up in earnest and really wanting to understand and certainly when we did the interviews with judges across the country for the report um, for iClear they they were very concerned about the lack of resources they they said that when they have glad you reports they are incredibly useful to them even when the even when the resources don't exist to create the exact healing plan, it it helps them understand the real um, the real mitigating factors that colonialism has created um, that have to be considered. So I I couldn't agree more that educating people properly is a huge part of this process, and then also in that educating them about the um, the ways that indigenous communities themselves, um, if they're willing and if they're able, can resource really innovative ways of engaging with healing plans for people and or um, where their and our, as it were, own laws come into play in terms of dealing with these situations in community. Um, so I think that we're, I think that we're on a path that could lead us to a very good place if people are willing to, you know, really be courageous about taking that work up and really engaging. And you see it sometimes. It's it's of course magical when it does happen. Let me let me just, if you will, you've been very kind and indulgent. Let, let me just follow that up briefly and ask you: um, did, did did you just then connect the dots and understand that what they're being confronted with in the Gladue report is obviously uh, a contextualization, a decolonial contextualization of a particular, uh, of a particular case with a particular set of circumstances. But what it, that case and those circumstances reveal is the colonial nature of the justice system to core you know, to, to begin with. So, and, yeah. and which would then, which would obviously have implications far beyond that case. Absolutely, um, and. Importantly, sometimes, <laughs> sometimes um, Gladio reports are read into the record, um, but lots of times they aren't. And I mean, I understand the balance that we have to work with there too, because it's a re-traumatizing experience, right? As the other side of Gladio reports for a person to talk about and for their family members and their community members and their elders to be interviewed about all the ways in which colonialism ha have impacted their community and their families um, and their lives is a horribly re-traumatizing um, methodology, right? Um, we can't deny that, but, um, but it does educate the court and it does educate the lawyers who are involved as well. So I think that when we see the ways in which judges um, publish decisions in which Gladue factors have been considered and there's been a Gladue report, they can very importantly put in the, the contextualizing factors that made them make the decision that they made. And that's also very important, as you're saying, in terms of obviously setting precedent in terms of case law, but also in terms of educate, educating people about the ways in which the, the criminalization of Indigenous peoples, um, communities and nations isn't isn't a one-off. It isn't about that one individual in that one circumstance, despite the fact that Canadian common law wants to carve that out and make that the case, right? That it's all about the individual. It really isn't. And Gladue reports make that very clear. I mean, it'd be interesting to collect the Gladue reports and I, 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 
as they have been issued, right? And then, and, and, and uh, I mean, I realize that they are uh, court specific and for court purposes, uh, they don't get circulated or published. I assume. No. But it would be interesting no, to, to, to collect them and digest them and, 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 and uh, distill their findings for a, a, a broader audience. Yeah, we might, I mean, I don't know if it's possible, we might see something like that go on in the future as we move forward. So in B, at least in BC, where Glad Do reports are more available to people, at least at this point, because we have the First Nations Justice Strategy and the First Nations Justice Council, Council which has now been funded by the provincial government to run um, a number of Indigenous justice centers across the province. Um, and they are the repository now for where GLADU reports are, are available to people. Um, so because they have a GLADU team and because they have um, a infrastructure for that, we may indeed in the future see some, some sort of a report or a study that is able to take a look at that. Um, this is provincial, I mean, and it's just the yeah. nobody else. For it. Yeah, at this point anyway. All right, well, thank you again for the presentation and, and, and your and your willingness to entertain my question. Of course, no question. problem. All right, and, yeah. and, and, and I, please, by all means, do make your, your, your details available and we'll ask people to send in questions as they have. Thank you. Perfect, again. okay. Thank you very much. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. Okay, Christina, it's, it's, it's now over to you. Um, so let me introduce Chris, Christina Ducat, who's a community psychology student at the University of Maryland, Baltimore County in the US. She began her career in abolitionist scholarship at NYU in 2015, working directly with girls in the juvenile justice system at the ROSES, Roses Advocacy Project. Her current research focuses on understanding the impacts of state violence in the juvenile justice system, particularly for girls and gender expansive kids, while exploring the unique ways these youth navigate the system and uh, resist oppression by the state. Um, and, and once again, um, this is a, a critical uh, dimension in, in uh, the overall analysis of, the, of, of race and carcerality, which has tended to be neglected. That's juvenile justice. And as far as I'm aware, um, this is one of the very few presentations we've had directed toward uh, juvenile justice. So uh, Christina, we're really interested to hear you. This is, uh, and you're going to be speaking on expanding the carceral net in the U.S. juvenile justice system, expanding the carceral net in the U.S. Ju juvenile justice system, exploring success, in quotes, in community-based programming. So Christina, over to you. Thank you so much for that information. And also want to thank Dr. Barkaskis again for that wonderful presentation. I'm hoping that mine sort of facilitates the conversation a little further on um, some of the paradoxes and tensions that come with alternatives to incarceration in the juvenile context. I am gonna share my screen. I have a little slide deck prepared just to help keep it organized. And are you seeing my slides and not my notes? Perfect. Yes, yes. Perfect, all right. Um, thank you everyone for having me today. As you said, I'm gonna be talking about the expansion of the carceral net in the US juvenile justice system and specifically focusing on how we measure success um, in community-based programming or community supervision for youth. Um, to begin, I wanted to give a brief overview of what I mean when I say net widening um, and the use of community-based programming or CBPs in the US juvenile system. So net widening in the juvenile system refers to the expansion of social control by the just justice system, where as part of reform efforts to avoid youth incarceration, we actually see more youth being brought into the juvenile justice system. And this happens because of the emphasis placed on preventing youth delinquency, where basically we have all of these policies and interventions that are focused on identifying at-risk youth, but what those functionally do is they catch youth who might never have actually offended for very, very low level minor offenses or just simply being at risk and getting that label and they get caught up in that carceral net and pushed into the formal system to rehabilitate them. One of the primary ways the juvenile justice system accomplishes this is by outsourcing their supervision. So staying away from formal courts or incarceration and moving into community-based supervision. 
Obviously, one of the more common examples that we might think of when we think of community supervision is probation, where you keep kids at home, but you still monitor their behavior to prevent further misbehavior. In the American juvenile system and also other systems as well, uh, there's been specific uh, caution around the use of this kind of supervision as it potentially expands the reach of the system into previously unmonitored venues. And we see this specifically with the recent emphasis on diversion programming for youth, um, where we sort of root kids around the court system if they're identified as at risk or doing low level offenses in efforts to keep them out of the further system. But we know that that actually tends to push kids into the system because of high failure rates in those programs. And we also know that increased supervision can actually perpetuate system involvement in that way because as people are surveyed more, they're more likely to get caught because you're watching them just by nature of that. And that can push them deeper into the system either by sending them back to court or incarcerating them for low, low level violations of those um, surveillance terms. Uh, the current study focuses on this type of community supervision and specifically what we're calling community-based programs or CBPs. CBPs are a hallmark of modern juvenile justice reform, particularly in the US. Um, they're a cheaper, more developmentally appropriate way of referring to youth to services and resources without relying on incarceration. And it's in efforts to, again, promote youth rehabilitation and reintegration into their communities. And while this new reliance on CBPs by the formal system outsources the care of juveniles to community organizations, it's important to note that they're still under the funding and overall supervision of the juvenile justice system. Now, these programs can provide a wide range of services and resources to system-involved youth, including therapy, vocational training, mentorship, drug and alcohol treatment, um, and youth are referred to these programs across formal system points. So from arrest all the way to post-release services after they've been re released from incarceration. Because of CBP's emerging prevalence um, in the US context, it becomes incredibly important for us to understand what the expectations youth are being held to within these programs so that we can also understand what it takes for youth to eventually leave the system, as well as what the system might consider to be indicators that a youth has been actually rehabilitated in the long term. There isn't a lot of literature or research into what the state specific standards of success for youth are, but we do know that failure in similar types of programming is very, very common. For example, uh, the literature on probation compliance tells us uh, in some cases more than half of youth on probation will violate the terms of their probation. And a lot of times those violations are actually part of, uh, are because they fail to comply with the terms of a CBP that they have been mandated to. And as I said earlier, that failure not only keeps kids in the system, it can actually push them further in. They can get charged with something called a technical violation if they fail the terms of their probation, and they can also be further incarcerated after the fact for that kind of failure. And because of, again, the novel proliferation of CBPs in the US system, we wanted to look at how CBPs define youth success by taking a closer look at their measurement of youth outcomes to see how that might illustrate the expansion of the carceral net into youth's lives. In order to do this, we conducted a systematic review of CBP evaluation literature and did a content analysis of their outcome metrics, which is what I'll be presenting on today. Um, I'm gonna start by describing the characteristics of CBPs or community-based programs so we can get a sense of what services exactly kids are getting referred to. And then we're gonna look specifically at what the outcome metrics being reported are and how those may systematically vary. Uh, to give you a quick overview of our sample, this study uh, reviewed the evaluation manuscripts of 68 CVPs being run in the United States between the years of 2005 and 2021. These programs were operating in 130 different sites in 33 of the United States, serving a total of nearly 30,000 youth, and that's just in the evaluation literature. So much more youth or many more youth are being exposed to these kinds of services. Uh, the pie chart here breaks down what services specifically CBPs are providing to youth. Uh, most commonly, programs in the sample were providing youth with wraparound services or case management services, which is where it's similar to a social services model where they'll be paired with a social worker or someone similar to that role to connect youth with resources to meet their unmet needs. Also really common were mental health programs like mandated therapy most of the time um, and restorative justice interventions like case conferencing or mediation where that is used in lieu of a traditional court process. 
Um, looking further at the characteristics of CVPs, we can start to see some variation in when youth are being referred to CVPs after they become system involved. So you can see here that youth are primarily being refer referred to CVPs as a form of diversion, which typically, but not always, means that they're mandated to the program after they're arrested, but before they see a judge or are formally charged. Again, that's not always the case, but that's generally what diversion looks like in the US. Um, and then again, following their release from a residential facility like a youth detention center in order to help facilitate their successful transition back into the community. And what we see here is that CBPs are primarily being used as tools to work with youth beyond the walls of the courtroom and beyond the walls of prisons and into youth's homes and communities. Now, this extension into their homes and communities by the formal justice system, of course, raises a lot of questions about what exactly are CBPs looking for from youth if they're indeed interested in promoting youth rehabilitation and preventing delinquency, we also wanna know how the system determines whether or not a youth has been successful enough in the program to be considered rehabilitated. Um, and one way to assess this um, sometimes abstract and unreported question that we chose to do for this study is to look at what youth outcomes CBPs are focusing on. Again, going through the different outcome metrics that each CBP reported in their evaluations, we found that on average programs report about four youth outcomes when they're talking about their program efficacy. That ranges from one all the way to 57 discrete outcomes within each program. So massive range in what exactly programs are reporting um, about youth outcomes. We group these outcomes into eight categories. So outcomes measuring youth recidivism or reoffending after they become, uh, after they complete the program education, risky behaviors, so that's usually things like substance use or risky sex behaviors, mental health, employment, interpersonal relationships, and housing outcomes. We also had another category which encompassed administrative variables like how many program sessions youth attended. And you can see pretty clearly from this graph that recidivism is far and away the most commonly measured youth outcome across programs. This aligns with what we would expect not only from the literature on juvenile justice uh, uh, rehabilitation, uh, but also just general knowledge about how the system works. We're interested in keep getting people out of it and keeping them from coming back in. However, you also see that most programs measure youth outcomes in additional domains beyond just recidivism. And this tells us that youth CVPs are demonstrating some amount of understanding that youth success isn't just contingent on whether or not they recidivate. And I think this illustrates a lot of the reform trends that we've seen in the last 20 years um, with the increased federal funding for CBPs and community supervision and that emerging acknowledgement that jail isn't necessarily the best option for youth and we need to invest in other strategies. However, because these CBPs, again, they're tied to the formal justice system and often funded by the juvenile the formal justice system, it also illustrates that most CBPs are to some extent monitoring youth or surveying youth in a wide range of domains that would not be monitored if they weren't under supervision. A good example of this is the relationships category. That's not something that you're going to be monitored on in your day-to-day -day life as a kid unless somebody is already keeping track of other uh, outcomes that you're having in your day-to-day -day life. Now, of course, looking at reported outcome metrics isn't a perfect measure of what it takes for youth to succeed or not fail their programs, but this does give us some insight into what impact CBPs are expecting that they're going to have on youth and where the, like the different places where the system might be monitoring youth in their homes and communities. Which leads us to our next research question. How might this expansive monitoring perpetuate disparities we already know exist within the juvenile justice system? And I'm gonna focus on racial disparities in this section. Even with the surface level analysis of outcome metrics that I just discussed, we're already starting to see a lot of variation in what outcomes are being measured and for which programs. This of course raises further questions about how deep that variation goes and if it's systematic, how might it align with the systematic marginalization of certain youth in the system? In order to answer those questions, we need to start by looking at which youth are being served by CVPs. And the main takeaway from this slide is overall, we're seeing the representation of different genders and different races on par with the rest of the system. But we know that those representations systematically disadvantage girls and youth of color. And again, I'm gonna focus on race here um, for the purposes of time. The majority of programs really quickly on gender though, served youth of mixed genders. Um, a couple, a good amount of programs served only boys and two programs specifically served girls. 
That lack of programming for girls is notable because the US has had a really strong emphasis in the last 20 years on creating gender responsive programming and funding gender responsive programming. Um, but the differences in that and the differences in outcome metrics could be an entire presentation on its own. Also happy to talk about it during the discussion. Um, but within mixed gender programs, girls make up about 27% of girls in CVPs. And that number is pretty comparable with what we see at other system points where girls uh, make up about 30%, depending on where you are looking in the system. Looking at race, unsurprisingly, the majority of youth served by CDPs are youth of color, making up an average about 60% of youth in each program. Again, this is aligned with what we already know about the overrepresentation of youth of color throughout the system. According to the last US census, I think youth of color made up a little less than half of youth, but they make up between 60 and 70% of youth throughout the system. Also, I wanted to note, since this is a presentation about measurement, um, I wanted to talk about how we measured race here. We decided to collapse race into white versus non-white categories for this analysis because race is reported incredibly inconsistently across programs. So not every program re reports all race categories. Sometimes only the number of youth of color or the number of black youth is reported. Sometimes Hispanic youth are counted as white youth. All of that data was really inconsistent across, so we decided to collapse it this way to include as much data as we can when we're making some quantitative comparisons. And when we reviewed the outcome definitions of each outcome metric, we noticed a lot of variation in what specifically they were asking and also how they were asking it, even if ostensibly they were measuring the same things. Uh, for example, one program might measure educational success by asking whether youth are skipping school or if they had dropped out. And that's like a very deficit based uh, measurement of youth education. Whereas another program might ask about youth GPA or whether or not they're planning on going to college or um, how satisfied they are with their relationship with those teachers. And you can see, even though those differences are subtle and they're both asking about education, the ways in which they're doing it can give us some insight into the impact CBPs are expecting to have on their youth and what they sort of um, are imagining as futures for youth. We looked at this variation a lot of different ways for this review, but I wanted to focus for this presentation on the prevalence of compliance-based metrics. Uh, we found two distinct categories of compliance in our data and coded them based on whether the, each outcome metric measured either rule breaking or rule abiding. Rule breaking was measured in about 42% of outcome metrics. Um, and those outcomes ask whether or not youth are engaging in behaviors that they're supposed to avoid. For example, a lot of these outcomes are measures of recidivism, so like self-reported offending, are you breaking the law? Um, rule abiding was measured in about 12% of outcome metrics, which asked whether or not youth are engaging in certain behaviors that they're expected to as set by the program. So for example, questions about, are you taking your mental health medication? Are you attending program sessions? Those are rule abiding aspects of compliance. And we use these frequencies of the compliance indicators to do a little bit of a qualitative exploration. I won't belabor the statistics here, um, but we wanted to see if the proportion of outcomes measuring compliance varies systematically and whether that aligns with what we already know about disparities in the system, specifically by race. Um, we found a, that rule breaking aspects are more commonly found in recidivism and risky behavior outcomes, whereas rule abiding outcomes uh, come in educational outcomes. We also use the frequency of these compliance codes to explore the relationships between CBPs and expectations of compliance and racial disparities across the system. So we know that the proportion of compliance based outcomes does vary significantly across system points. And we also know that the highest proportion of youth of color is in diversion programming. So mostly, most youth of color are being referred to divert, youth of color are overrepresented in diversion programming. And we also know that compliance is really high in diversion programming. And we wanted to see if they varied together. We ran a one way ANOVA, which is what that graph uh, is talking about. And you can see based on the shape of the lines and also the significance that the proportion of compliance-based outcomes and the proportion of youth of color vary together across system points. And what this suggests is that the way that we're measuring youth outcomes might particularly disadvantage youth of color because the programs that they are systematically referred to are also systematically focused on rule compliance, which is a more restrictive definition of youth success. Now, of course, the use of CBPs is not inherently a bad thing, particularly as the alternative for these is often incarceration. 
We know that the system involvement for youth is directly tied to their needs at home and in their communities. And so it makes sense to target these needs in order to prevent delinquency. We can even go so far as to say that there is value in measuring kids on outcomes beyond just whether they recidivate. There's value in providing youth with resources or caring for their mental health or avoiding formal court processes with, with short of justice interventions. Our cause for concern, however, is the location of these programs. Because these programs are entrenched in the juvenile justice system, whatever resources they're providing or however holistic their measurement, they can't be disentangled from the carceral state and the implications of that for youth. Taken together, our findings are demonstrating a dense web of potential monitoring of youth by the state, and that's illustrated by the wide range of outcomes being used to measure youth success in CVPs. Um, much of this monitoring is in areas that we would expect, like recidivism, but we're also seeing monitoring in areas that wouldn't be monitored unless we had, I, hadn't identified kids as being at risk or uh, delinquent. Things like their family, peer and romantic relationships, their employment status and educational goals, all of those being monitored by the state has implications for how the state is going to define their success and whether or not they end up leaving the system in the long term. We see that racial disparities that we know to be true are being replicated in CBPs. And overall, when we look at these outcomes, we're seeing they're focused on compliance, they're being more restrictive, and that is disproportionately impacting youth of color. These trends uh, are evidence of the carceral creep, which is a phenomenon in which the formal system will sort of outsource monitoring and resources to the nonprofit sector. That trend isn't new. Advocates working in abolitionist, ab intimate partner violence, disability justice circles, they've all been aware of this and talking about this and researching this um, and this, these sort of harms for decades. And I think we can learn a lot for how to from them on how to resist the expansion of the carceral net in the juvenile system. Uh, what, we don't see, what we don't see in these outcomes is the prioritization of positive or pro-social youth outcomes like relationship quality or career aspirations. That's not very common in outcome metrics. Um, and integration of more strengths-based measurement like this, which assess youth outside of the constraints of this and the surveillance of the juvenile system can allow us to have a better understanding of how youth survive and thrive in systems which are designed to marginalize them. The lingering question, of course, is what exactly does that look like for us in our work? In recent years, there's been renewed discussion about what reform looks like in the juvenile justice system, which is widely known to be broken. And these conversations have been echoed in the academy where we talk a lot about being inclusive and equitable and justice oriented, or even go so far as to call ourselves decolonial. However, as we see in this study, there are inherent tensions between being strengths-based in your work and working, and also the necessity of working with the justice system if you're doing justice system research. Um, for example, if we're evaluating system programs. In order for us to truly uplift the well being and success of youth outside of and in opposition to the marginalizing force of, of the juvenile justice system, it's up to us to hold ourselves accountable to being and allying ourselves with youth success on their own terms. Christina, thank you for a, a, a really compelling presentation um, about which I have a number of questions, but I'll hold anything off um, because in, in, in the meanwhile, uh, Brian has joined us. Brian, welcome. Um, let me introduce you and, and, and uh, ask you to speak to us without further ado. Um, Brian, are you? I'm sorry, Samir. Samir, are you with us? Yes. Yes. yes sorry. Dr. sorry. sorry. Uh, Dr. Samir Bula is, is, a, is a practicing physician in uh, Toronto in the psychiatry department at Toronto Hospital, and he's the past president of the Black Medical Students Association um, and co-founder of the Doctors for Defunding the Police. So, um, Samir, I'm glad that you, you, you finally made it. Uh, so apologies, uh, you haven't been able to, to, to catch the first presentation, but at least you got uh, most of the second so let me turn things over to you and then we'll have a, we'll save some time at the end for questions. We've got 15 minutes, um, please perfect. take it away. Perfect, perfect. Well, I wanna thank everyone for being here and I also wanna thank my co-speakers. Uh, it was wonderful listening to you and it is nice hearing about the American context as well and trying to understand what's happening there. So just to give you guys an, ex um, 
understanding why I'm here. So my name is Samir Bullet, and I'm one of the co-founders of Doctors for Defunding Police. So I'm basically going to give a little brief talk about what defunding the police looks like in the Canadian context, and talk a little bit about the struggles we've had in supporting the communities and the people who, who really suffer from the brunt of police brutality and the sequelae of poverty. So just to give an example, so I grew up in the community in the Northwest of Toronto that's mainly made up of immigrants and people with a low-income background. So I grew up in the community that was forced to interact with police a lot, to be honest. I noticed very early on how police would use violence in order to, and the threat of it really, to intimidate the kids in my community, my friends, my cousins, my brothers. I've all been directly abused by the police coming into our communities with more carte blanche uh, to commit violence against us. The problem with a lot of our communities is the qualified immunity. Um, the fact that the police officers do not come from the community and they do often carry themselves like a foreign occupying force. With statistics like 75% of the police officers in Toronto don't even live in the city of Toronto. Um, for example, um, when I was 16 and I began to drive, um, I would always get pulled over by the police and the officers would give me variations of the same uh, excuse that they were just checking who I was or what I was doing because the community you lived in, once you would leave the barriers, there would always be some type of police presence. And, at the end of my first year of driving, I was carted over a dozen times so when I never committed a single offense. Even when I was driving one way down the street and the police officer would be driving the other, they would make eye contact, pull a U-turn, and check you out. So the problem here is, unless you're from a low-income, racialized community, you're often left in the dark about what truly happens in Canada, in these neighborhoods, and especially even in Canada, which a lot of people never even know about. So police officers here, here are really taught that they're the thin blue line between civil society and complete anarchy. But in the reality, they do look at a lot of us like criminals who, and thugs who are guilty until proven innocent. Um, we've had cases like DeAndre Campbell, where he called not, recently called 911 on himself during a mental health crisis and ended up being shot by the police, uh, where to this day, the offending officer who shot him does not have to give a statement or be investigated whatsoever due to the policies we have in Canada. Um, this is the same story we hear about the SIU, so their Special Investigations Unit, over and over again, um, where we have an independent review board filled with former police officers. Uh, we have the same thing that happened with the patient of uh, the people, Caleb Tubila Njoko, uh, Sammy Atim, who was shot nine times due to a transit fare issue, Aisha Hudson, who was a 16-year-old Indigenous girl who was killed when stealing alcohol, and Ijaz Chaudhry, um, a family asked an elderly man to, who was in a mental health crisis, they asked, uh, the police to de-escalate. Within three seconds, they already shot him. So, and so many more. We have countless cases and they always keep happening in our, in our country. So even in the prison system with correctional officers, we recently had the results from the Soleimani Fakiri case uh, where a young schizophrenic man was tortured and beaten to death with a bag over his head. Even, and even though the chief forensic pathologist in Ontario, so one of the doctors did a review and found that the prison guard's actions directly led to the death of the, of the patient, um, no one will be charged. So the family fought for years in order for this to be reopened. The chief pathologist said, yes, the issues of what the guards did led to his prison, his death, but because we don't know who dealt the final blow, we can't charge anybody. So when people ask for police reform and um, should say and say constantly that we should be waiting for the full report from the SIU before we jump to conclusions and things like that, we want people to understand that in Ontario, where we're from in Toronto, uh, the SIU was created over 30 years ago in 1990. Uh, these problems have been going on in our communities for decades, and we've been screaming about it into the void for a very long time. So we cannot, it's very obvious at this point, but we cannot police ourselves out of systemic poverty and systemic racism, as was clear from the second uh, presentation as well. Policing is a public health crisis. Um, by now we're aware of the, the origins of policing. A lot, it was to protect private property. There used to be slave controls. Here in Canada, specifically with the RCMP, they were very much known to push indigenous people off their land and take that land. So, and to even give more context, uh, the fact that every school I went up to growing up in the Toronto District School Board, so the most focused district for Toronto, always had a police officer, but never a psychologist, nurse, or anyone to help the students there. In fact, Toronto, York Region, and most recently Peel District, so those are the three areas around Toronto, um, have all been under review for human rights abuses um, as a result of anti-Black systemic racism. And the Peel District School Board so much, the provincial government had to step in and remove the, the board leader themselves. So in any other, if any other system worked like this and as efficiently and recklessly as the police, they would be completely dismantled and reset. What if there was a few bad, a few bad apple pilots or a few bad apple surgeons or doctors? Would we be all right with them in our society? Obviously not. So the question is, why are police allowed to function with such immunity? 
As doctors, all of our actions are under the scrutiny of a cost-benefit analysis down to which tests to order and when to do them. We need to rationalize every action we do because of the healthcare budget. Yet, where's the transparency in our police budgets? Uh, defunding the police to me is a truly an abolitionist project. And abolishing the police to me um, doesn't mean there are no officers on the street immediately, but imagining a world where there are no need for police officers, where people have the needs and the things that they need that would probably divert them from doing the crimes that we constantly see happening in society. To me, there are clear intersections with the feminist movement. Violence against women cannot be solved by the carceral state. And the police are in fact some of the biggest perpetrators and conductors of sexual violence against women and minors. There's literally a sex ring that was busted up recently in Toronto where a high ranking cop was one of the top people hiding some of the things happening. And we have multiple studies showing that up to 40% of police officers have been involved in some form of domestic abuse within their own families. How many stories have we heard of women trying to get the police to protect them from a man or somebody just for the police to say the threat isn't serious enough for them to do something at this time? And before you know it, the woman is abused to the point of no return or even killed. Are the police really the best way to deal with this type of violence? And what about that violence during against women? Does jailing a man or woman who completes this, who commits this act, reduce the likelihood of it happening again or to another woman? No, because sexual violence and violence against women cannot be solved by the carceral state. It just creates more peoples behind bars and never addresses the root causes of these said issues. Decriminalization is a lot what we're asking for in some issues, what we define as crime. Threats to our safety, our security, don't come from what is currently defined as crime, but threats come from the failures of institutions in our country to deal with issues of health, education, justice, opportunity, and so much more. The police in their past and current forms have never been about protecting the peace, safety, or security for all the masses, but for the subjugation of certain undesired populations and the accumulation of capital. Why do police help process evictions, suppress protests and strikes, and are disproportionately in the poorer, more colored schools? Because in, a, in our estimate, it seems to be that is their purpose. Control and corral the undesirables, the more vulnerable, the people whose labor really fuels our economies as the essential workers, risking their health and the health of their families because they have no options. The police were created to really push a lot of these communities, and they are well-funded to do it. So we spend $41 million a day on policing in Canada. 10% uh, of the Toronto's city budget, so over $1.2 billion, is what we spend on the police, and it never seems to stop growing. The police state, the prison system, the justice system are all somewhat extensions of the prison and military industrial complex and the state's monopoly on violence. And the fact that the state is only serving the oligarchs or the capital holders in our society, where we have crazy facts, like two Canadians had more wealth than 11 million Canadians in the, before the pandemic started, or during the pandemic where we have stats like the top 20 Canadians made $40 billion during just seven months of the pandemic, while the lowest proportion of the Canadians lost a similar amount of money. So, so the people with all the wealth and capital seem to be using a police more as an extension of their power. But what if we imagine a world where they do not have that unilateral hold on that power and instead it was shared democratically with the communities having access to resources to take care of themselves? What if we could shift capital away from the policing and raise and divert taxes from the extremely wealthy who have sometimes not paid their fair share in decades and invest in that in education, healthcare, community investment, reintegration, and rehabilitation of the criminal and true empowerment of marginalized communities, investment in jobs, et cetera. So imagine, so just to conclude, to imagine the intellectual world where we can have, where we can have people to be free as they possibly could be. We create and utilize a bigger tax base to invest in the true future of the country by investing in people because the human capital right now, we are wasting so much potential by creating systems that exclude and destroy so many people. So I believe as doctors for defunding the police, we really have three main takeaways from the work that we do and other ideas that we've been trying to put forth in the community. So the first takeaway and the first ask that we've been really pushing is full transparency of all police and RCMP budgets with full disclosure on how and more particularly why the police budget allocations have been prioritized over things like mental health, social education, social funding, housing, recreation, and other healthcare resources and allocation. Number two would be an immediate change to the use of force laws because we do have, we need to forbid the, the lethal force that we constantly see in bodily harm with disarming police officers who work with certain civilians, especially with the homeless population, people in mental health crises, or people in petty theft, because we have a lot of stories in Canada where people, if the situations where the police did not show up, these people would not be dead. If we're not asking if the mental health crisis should have been averted in a different way, but all we're saying is we need to give people opportunities to heal and get better. And sometimes the police are not the best option. And finally, um, defunding the police budget with reallocation towards 
Uh, first, the, crea the creation of new community emergency services to support the mental health of Black, Indigenous, racialized, disabled, poor, and other community members made vulnerable a lot by the structural violence that we see in our institution. And really the creation in part B, the creation of non-police response teams trained in de-escalation and crisis support who root their work in transformative trauma and community informed practices. So in Toronto, we actually do have, so just to give some credit, we actually during COVID have started some pilots in these communities. So we have four major pilots happening in Toronto where major community groups that have already been doing work on the ground in crisis care have been given more of a budget and a phone number to now get some of the diversion from 911 calls. And it does seem to be something that is working and hopefully we'll get more data on that as well. And finally, to me, it is clear that police, despite increasing yearly budgets, not made significant impacts in the reduction of crime. Um, after multiple decades of failed attempts at police reform, tangible solutions need to center the voices of the people in the communities because the safest communities are the ones with the most resources. Thank you. Tamir, thank you. Uh, I, since we are a very modest gathering now, um, and as I explained at the outset, you wouldn't have heard this, um, because the carceral policy policing um, and race conference is, going, is, is taking place live in the background. Most of the people who would have attended this session, which is a, 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 a special online session, um, will be attending the live sessions of the conference. So they will be viewing this later, we're recording it. And I should have warned you that we are recording it. Um, so please let me know if you have any if you have a problem with that. But no worries at all. No worries. Okay, great. Um, I mean, frankly, if I were you, I'd be pleased and proud to have myself recorded for 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 a, a picture audience. And we've got um, a, a really splendid assemblage of scholars and activists for this conference. And I'm sorry they're not here to put questions to you directly. So let, let me, if, if both of you will indulge me, because Christina, I'm also, you know, I'm, I'm also going to sort of ask questions as a proxy for the audience of you. So if we can engage briefly in a, in a conversation, um, let's do that. And I guess I, I, let me start with you, uh, Christina, because the whole idea of of, of um, outsour outsourcing uh, juvenile justice using um, community-based programs is obviously sounds enlightened and progressive, but turns out not to be the case at all, right? So since you, you characterize it, I think, you know, quite um, eloquently as, as, as and, 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 and persuasively as outsourcing, um, so that instead of being uh, an alternative form of justice, it really just becomes an adjunct form of justice uh, which expands and enhances the defects of the existing justice system, right? So it, 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 it enables, um, I, uh, it effectively amounts to outsourcing, monitoring and surveillance and control um, as the primary functions, which, which, which these programs, well, if not the primary functions that these programs seem to be discharging, at least um, a, 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 uh, a very significant priority set of functions. Um, so what uh, the, the, the I guess part of the difficulty is getting people to think that um, community-based, although you know, again, it has the, 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 the attractiveness and the ring and the resonance of, you know, of, of, of an alternative form um, of, of justice and a, and a kinder, gentler, milder, milder form of justice is actually um, serving very dubious and pernicious ends. Um, so I, my question to you is, you know, how do you get people to, to, is this just, is this misbranding? Is this mislabeling? Is this sort of using the, the, the term community um, really to disguise um, this insidious form of outsourcing that you describe? And is it a matter of relabeling? Um, so how do you, I, how do you sort of, uh, how do you imagine um, reinventing these kinds of, of, of community-based programs, um, but ensuring them against their weaponization, their instrumentalization um, for these kinds of monitoring and control and surveillance purposes. Sorry, that's, that's, a, that's a broad question, but you can take it in any direction you like. No, that's a really good question. It's something I ask a lot. I think you're right. I think a lot of it is relabeling 
um, a lot of the, the I like the like the dubious that was the word I was looking for in my presentation, but I couldn't remember um, the the sort of more is this actually doing what we're saying we're doing? Are we doing something sort of behind the scenes is a characteristic of not only the juvenile justice system, not only the American context. If you look at the history of any sort of carceral system, which we can learn a lot from abolitionist schol scholars who have been analyzing the system in this way, this is not a new trend. This is just sort of a latest version of the carceral state replicating and expanding itself. So we see that in trends with how prisons and mass incarceration has sort of expanded in the last 50 years. We see this in policing. We see this um, um, recent example that's been getting a lot of attention in the adult system is electronic monitoring. So having ankle monitors and being at home, but your home is not your jail. Um, that is, it's not a new trend. And I think it illustrates a lot of the, the goals of the carceral state, um, which is to protect and expand itself. And it can do that by doing that sort of subversion um, and a lot of that is based in capitalism and the economic value of like hoarding resources and keeping the resources within the carceral state to, to preserve itself. I think that's sort of what we're seeing in this case in the juvenile system and also elsewhere. When it comes to resisting it, I think that is a question for ever. Um, I think one of the things that I really value, especially working with kids, um, and like advocating for kids when kids aren't around, like in spaces like this um, is emphasizing the fact that we do need to trust kids and kids know what is, kids know what they're doing. They have very sophisticated and nuanced like analyses of the system and how it's working and where it's monitoring them and how to navigate that system, how to resist it, how to subvert surveillance in different ways. They're very smart about that. If you talk to them about like what they're doing in terms of their in terms of like how they're becoming system involved and i think channeling that into if we're doing if we're developing programs if we're evaluating programs channeling that into what we're doing is the best way to resist it because the kids know best they know they live it they they live it they breathe it it's like functionally all impacting them so it makes a lot of sense to integrate them in that methodologically obviously youth participatory action research is like a good way to do that a lot of like highlighting the voices of youth organizers and making sure that whenever we're talking about policy or we're talking about programs, the, their voices need to be at the table because otherwise our adult perspectives are going to be what comes out. And we tend to have a sort of ageist perspective on, well, I know what these kids need. I, you know, I remember being a teenager once and I think that there's a radical mindset that can happen if you're, if you're thinking, if you're thinking about including youth that can be more expansive and in the long term more protective to youth. How do you control then for sort of counter subversive responses to revelations of, you know, subversive tools and techniques? Right. So, so, so um, once and that, this is in some sense a question of, of, of academic and activist ethics, because once you identify and analyze and publicize all the really clever and cool things that kids have, yeah. you know, devised, uh, you know, to, 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 to dodge and get around and defeat. Um, the, 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 you know, multitude of new mechanisms that have been developed, right, then, I, then people think, okay, right, so now we're going to have to go back and build a better, better mousetrap because they're escaping from these mousetraps. If I had an answer to that, I wouldn't have a job. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think, I think about that a lot whenever I'm working, whenever I'm talking to or on behalf of youth, and I think a lot of that, again, comes to having really honest conversations with youth and being like okay this is what we're seeing this is like what how do you want to present it and giving them that autonomy over it is one way to protect it and making sure they have control over their own narratives and i think collaborative like academic methodologies sort of they build that in right they have that sort of um that assumption that the researcher isn't the person who knows what's best they aren't the person who knows what to report and what not to report um, I think it becomes the burden of the researcher to identify those ethical tensions. Like if like you find something that like you have to report your findings, but like this could like harm youth, like whatever, how do you do that? And I think that's a really case by case basis. But I think again, turning back to the youth always gives a, an answer on how to approach it because it's their lives at stake, not yours. Thanks, Christina. So let me, let me, let me turn things over to you now. Uh, I, I mean, that was an amazingly uh, 
eloquent and 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 and, and really lapidary, um, you know, some fifteen minute encapsulation of the abolitionist case. Um, I mean, I, I, so well done you. That was a, like a superb articulation of the, of, the, of the principal arguments for abolition. And I just so you want to, you, you, I, I told um, uh, Christina and, and Patricia uh, initially that when I introduced the conference yesterday, I said that this was really a watershed moment um, when the issue, that when, when uh, race and carcerality and policing were finally being uh, appreciated and understood at the proper scale, um, and this, you know, I, and, and 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 it wasn't accidental um, that we, you know, discovered there were a multitude of, of researchers and activists, um, and analysts and scholars who were busy exploring these issues and the relationships among race, uh, carcerality, and, and policing in multiple diverse geographic contexts. That that. that and uh, part of this watershed, part of this, you know, this, this historical conjuncture, you know, is, 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 is the advent of abolitionism and the sort of the, 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 the elaboration and the maturation of the abolitionist arguments because they've, they're game changing, right? So now we're, just, we're dealing in a totally different discursive terrain now that we have the abolitionist case out there, right? So, um, and, and, and I wanted to ask you as, as a doctor specifically, because I, I, I'm fascinated by, you know, the, the, I mean, just the, the idea of, of a group of physicians um, coming together and, and, and agitating for abolitionism, you know, effectively making the medical case, the, the, the public health case for, 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 for abolition is, 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 is just amazing. Um, so if I had to take it. Let me articulate a little bit because it, it's, um, it's very interesting that we even got to this point because if I can tell you how we got to becoming doctors for defunding the police, were we able to let me just say, it, it put me in mind of, you know, physicians for human rights, right? And obviously, mm. there are a lot of analogies, because essentially, you know, treating the, the, the police as an occupying army or you know, a militia, paramilitaries, I mean, you know, what the Janjaweed are to the Sudan, right? The, the Toronto cops are to Toronto, right? And just, yep. I, you know, so understanding, you know, the, 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 the police as essentially... Um, enforcers of a racial order and dispenses dispensers of state violence right yep. they're not here they're not here to serve you is like our main argument that we try to put out here mm -hmm. uh, well in just to like back up so a lot of the times when we're doing so side so the psychiatry if you see what's happening in our psychiatric wards in canada right now specifically in toronto it, it's it's ridiculous it's absolutely ridiculous the amount of carceral violence, the amount of poverty you really see, the amount of like the sequelae of long-standing trauma that is just brought out in just so much acuteness. There's acute suicidality, psychosis, whatever is going on. And what we're trying to say is my responsibility as a doctor doesn't end the second you get out of my emergency room or my clinic or my office or whatever I decide to work in. If I've taken on the mantle of a doctor and I care about your health, if when you leave my office, the things that are impacting you being your education, your, your, your workforce, the people in your community, the jobs available to you, if we're not working on those to kind of complete the person, then I think we're, we have a huge disservice. And a lot of the doctors, that, so we actually were able to get over 600 doctors to sign on to this group, but the main core of, this of the group of doctors for defunding police is about 50 doctors, even smaller is like the organizing group, about 10 doctors, and those are like very abolitionist very focused doctors. And if you can see all of these doctors, we don't work in the same fields like at all. Like I'm one of the only psychiatrists there and I work mainly, mainly like forensics and like the prison where, where it uh, aligns. Other doctors we have are like palliative care um, addictions doctors. We have um, family, a lot of family medicine doctors. We have emergency doctors. We have people in different aspects of the system who see people in different places. And then they've also gotten to the conclusion over years of this, right? I know I'm young in the game, but I'm the youngest doctor amongst the other doctors. And they've gone to the same similar conclusions where we're, we're putting our resources in the wrong place and expecting different results because we, we have gun violence issues in Toronto in certain communities where it, if you go into those communities and you spoke to the people who are most affected and the families that are most impacted, th there's a pattern. There's a clear pattern of poverty, not trusting the system, not having any access to resources, not, not feeling like they are a marginalized, dejected part of society. So nowadays, we're really trying to say that 
as doctors who, who really believe in the health of our communities being the first and foremost thing that we care about, we have to have every aspect of a person's life, at least in our focus. And right now what we're saying is policing in of itself is a huge detriment to our imagination as a society because every time there's a shooting or there's a crime that happens in certain communities or uh, there's something bad that happens, the, the direct response is more police funding. It's constantly more police funding. And it's never a, an intellectual agreement or argument about like, okay, this happened because of these reasons. What can we do to reduce some? Yes, will there be need to be some violence protection? And absolutely in some areas. But how do we get to the root of a lot of these issues? And many of the times we don't we don't think like that. In in medicine, when I was taught through medical school, we, we weren't taught to think like that. But when you get onto the field and you see, I was talking to other ret retiring doctors now, and they're talking about how the field has changed completely and they can't even imagine practicing now because the the scope of the patients that we're seeing it's so much more acute. There, there's so many new things coming up where the mental health aspects are bleaching into other things or going into other things. And we have to, we have to be much more you honest. Are other psychiatrists or? The... Yeah, yeah, we have a lot of psychiatrists working with us. You, know, I, 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 you are aware, of course, that you have an illustrious predecessor as, yeah. a, as a decolonial psychiatrist. Yes, yes. So, I, I mean, it's it, it, it's no accident that, that, that you know, Fanon. Yep wrote as he did and analyzed as he did on the basis of his clinical practice. So his clinical practice, you know, informed in a fundamental way his entire approach to, to, to decolonization Absolutely. and his understanding of, you know, colonialism um, as a generator of multiple pathologies, right? So mm -hmm. he had the evidence of those pathologies in his patients. So, so I, 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 the, the connection between you know, psychiatry and, 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 and anti-colonial struggle is a, a, a venerable one. Um, I, I'm sure. I'm, I'm sure you're aware of that. Um, yeah. We are the cops. We joke. We are the cops. We've been the cops of like the medicine for the longest time, taking away people's rights without any like due process. But yeah. Yeah. So this. I, so right. So psychiatrists have this 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 dual valence. I mean, on the one hand, you know, they, they, they can um, effectively adjunct security officers. Um, but it's, it's also a privileged place, you know, as, 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 as Fanon certainly demonstrated, from which to develop a critique Absolutely. of the system. Absolutely. And that's, that's uh, it's the kind of absurdity, right? Because the daily things that you see working in psychiatry, you will see every day. I don't want to call it a crime, but a tragedy, like, like a tragedy of the system and a person that could have easily been diverted at an earlier stage or even at this stage, but we don't have the resources or the energy or the, the, the wherewithal to really push. So nowadays there, there is like a old school and new school of psychiatry, I guess we're kind of in the Fanon uh, category. We kind of think that we have to take care of the whole patient and if the systems and the institutions are the ones causing the damage, then I think we have to attack those. Well, listen, both. I, I, I would really love to, to, to keep this conversation going and it's, and it's thrilling to meet you both. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, only sorry that Patricia couldn't stay for the end of the discussion. It's, it's, it's just, you know, it, 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 when we put these panels together, you know, we, we were mixing chemicals and we had no idea whether we, what kind of reaction we'd get. But um, I have to say, this is, this, we, for every one of these panels, and I've, I've, I've been present uh, at a number of them and chaired now too, with a, um, there's the same sort of amazing productive chemistry uh, and 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 the the the, um, the interventions that people have prepared, not being aware of one another necessarily, um, nonetheless speak to one another in all sorts of ways, and I and I certainly have that feeling today, and I hope the both of you do. So, thank you, for thank you for making yourselves available, and and, and uh, we will uh, post this in due course on the website, and do keep in touch because we'd like to involve you in in in. in um, the, the ongoing development of this project. So if you're if you're you know willing to to, to, to sign on and, and continue to be informed of and involved with uh, uh, events in our eventual research protocol as we develop it, then absolutely, please. Um, thank, thank you. I want to thank Oliver, even if he's here, if he's not here. But it's always great working with people internationally that have similar ideas, and we have to hope to try to make a better world. Right, that's our job. Right, so that's a great note on which to end. So, uh, Christina, Samira, thank you again both. Be in touch.
Absolutely. Take care.